Welcome everyone to our third panel session of the day to celebrate the reopening of the Detroit Observatory. My name is Austin Edmister and I'm the Assistant Director for Astronomy at the Detroit Observatory. I get to work with our director, Dr. Gary Krenz, and our wonderful team of student docents to share the magical views of the night sky through our historic telescopes. This panel is intended to focus on the Detroit Observatory as an historic site for contemporary education. The first two panels gave a wonderful context to the origins and the history of the observatory, and now we want to explore the function of the observatory in the present and into the future as a site for learning and growing and connecting with the history and education of the University of Michigan. I have the great privilege of moderating this panel featuring the following panelists. Uh, Robert Stencil, uh, Dr. Robert Stencil, is Professor Emeritus of Astronomy from the University of Denver, where he studied stellar evolution and is the former director of the Chamberlain Observatory at the University of Denver. Dr. Stencil's time with the Chamberlain Observatory has provided him with a deep knowledge of using an historic observatory to share the night sky through a one-of-a-kind 19th century telescope. Michelle McLellan is the Joanna Meyer Magoon Principal Archivist at the Bentley Historical Library, which is sort of our parent institution at the Detroit Observatory. Michelle joins us to provide an important perspective on the use of historic sites as a tool for education, especially in a college setting. She has taught history at museums, the National Park Service, and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. She now works at the Bentley Historical Library as the Principal Archivist, where she diligently works to collect, save, and promote the story of Michigan. Finally, we have Dean Regas, who works at the Cincinnati Observatory as the lead astronomer. During his time there, Dean has become an invaluable local resource for observational astronomy and telescopes. He also has broad experience with sharing astronomy to the larger public. Dean has been co-host of PBS's Stargazers, authored four astronomy books, and written astronomy articles for publications such as Astronomy Magazine and the Huffington Post. For this panel, we will spend a short time with each panelist and then expand to larger conversations with everybody. Please let us know if you have any questions in the YouTube channel chat, and we will try to answer those as best as we can at the end of the panel. <clears throat> All right. Um... Well, thank you for that introduction, Austin, and uh, uh, to Ann Arbor folks, um, since I represent the University of Denver today, uh, as you know, the Denver hockey team kind of made short work of the Michigan hockey team in the Final Four last night. It happens, and it's a matter of who wanted it more, perhaps. Nonetheless, um, the topic today concerns historic sites and contemporary education. And in addition, the challenges of diverse inclusivities and how to address all of these together. So as, as we in astronomy often say, the study of the natural world helps promote logic and let us see above our immediate surroundings. And an earlier panel, we heard that uh, rendition in terms of the development of 19th century philosophy and the emergence of science and engineering. So in modern parlance, if we can stay full of wonder and see the bigger picture, we're winning with the students. So I have a slightly wordy chart, but want to hit a few highlights here. The situation constantly changes, and I'll talk about our experience in Denver with the Antique Observatory, too, but outreach is key. I think, as Sally Owey in the last panel mentioned, um, it's what helps engage the students, particularly some authentic hands-on experiences, not just passive lectures. So in addition to the use of the fabulous Fitz Telescope at Detroit Observatory, there are some nearby opportunities, and maybe I'm addressing Austin and Mary with this, that nearby you do have nice rooftop telescopes at Angel Hall, as well as at Detroit Observatory, some kind of partnership relationship to expand the number of viewing opportunities might be something to consider. Uh, similarly, just downhill a little bit is the U of M Natural History Museum, which indeed does daytime solar imaging and spectroscopy. Those are great opportunities. Ultimately, Detroit Observatory might include those, but they're already available down the block. <clears throat> One angle we've used uh, 
at Chamberlain Observatory, U of Denver's historic Chamberlain Observatory, is treating it, uh, the observatory, as a stargate, particularly a science, technology, engineering, math oriented stargate. And that at least piques the interest of many students and is another helpful draw in terms of promotional materials websites. In addition to that, um, we uh, <clears throat> seek partnerships in all kinds of ways, particularly regional astronomy clubs. Uh, they have been fabulous volunteer help at the Denver Observatory, but also it's helped us raise the profile, the awareness of light pollution and the need for light pollution solutions that have, you know, so much changed the view of the night sky. And when people can't see the stars, they stop thinking about them. One opportunity near term is called Earth Night, uh, which occurs during dark sky week, end of the month. More about that in chat, if you like. So <clears throat> it's fun to make a little comparison, and maybe it's helpful I've gone first here. Uh, Detroit, Denver, Cincinnati. We have our respective representatives, uh, Austin and Gary for Detroit, uh, Dean for Cincinnati. Note the dates of uh, founding, essentially 1854 Detroit, 1888 Denver, 1843 Cincinnati, the grandmother of them all. Uh, compare the locations. Detroit is solidly locked in the middle of a campus, whereas Denver and Cincinnati are in a park and residential area. That gives us a very different audience, essentially, or at least opportunities. Uh, there, there's plenty of time later to talk about the differences among the refractors, all special instruments in their own ways. And conditions are pretty good for my colleagues. I wish ours were in better shape, although we have brought it back into service over the past couple decades. Again, light pollution, I would regard as extreme in Ann Arbor and very extreme in Denver. Dean can comment on that for Cincinnati. It didn't seem great, uh, night sky viewing. But um, there is also a social justice angle to this, if time permits, I'll come back to. So here in the little image, you can see the effect of uh, downtown Denver, five miles away, light pollution in a bit of cloud, scattering situation. But um, we found over time that the best way to preserve a building is to continue its use as intended. So to that extent, uh, the education outreach at our Chamberlain Observatory, it's been a community STEM resource, maybe not in those terms, but uh, as with Detroit, influencing generations of people. Uh, it's particularly been a symbol of neighborhood traditions, cohesion, and a rallying point. And we heard to that effect in the first panel, indicating how uh, you know, President Tappan saw the opportunity, the value of having a premier institution facility uh, early on to provide that rallying point. In our case, uh, old building, 100-year curse, uh, the bulldozers were revving up to knock it down. But uh, through work of myself, my wife, and others, we managed to get it onto a historic landmark status that really has saved it, resulted in restoration. But we still need paid staffing because volunteers can't do everything. So just a little inside, here's a sketch of the building, still in very good shape, and the 20-inch uh, F-15 refractor. So for perspective, that is about 20 foot tall at the center. We need a gantry ladder uh, to accommodate it, and there's a Twitter site for further information. Now, uh, earlier, Sally Oe and uh, Pat Seitzer mentioned generations of DU astronomers being sent out to the world, including myself, uh, 1970s PhD graduate of University of Michigan. But prior to that, I met my wife basically on the steps of Detroit Observatory, this uh, front door scene, when the building wasn't in very good shape, but you know, it 
nice place to hang out. So, uh, of course, some of the trees and bushes have come and gone in the meantime. But just to indicate that uh, <clears throat> there is a closure, a continuity. And I'm, I'm delighted with the progress that's been shown, uh, led by Gary and all the donors and any number of faculty and uh, staffers to get the observatory into the great shape it is now. So perhaps I've said enough, um, and I turn that back to our moderator. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. And I just want to say, as the field archivist for the Michigan Historical Collections, we see the importance of, of archival preservation because it's those photos are amazing and it's just great to see them. So it's so important to save our historical materials. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more broadly about teaching with historic places, not necessarily observatories per se. and Teaching with place, I think, has a lot of parallels with teaching with primary sources, which the Bentley has a great amount of experience and leadership in doing already. And in both cases, we really just want to get as close as possible to the stuff of history, whether that's a diary, a letter, a newspaper, or the built environment, the fabric of the built environment. And in both of those cases, it can really be a tool, I think, for encouraging historical empathy, encouraging historical imagination. It's not just about facts or dates even though that's how some of us were taught history in middle school or high school. So I'm going to talk very briefly just about a couple projects that I've been involved in. Again, these are not observatories per se, but as a way to illustrate what I think is some of the value of teaching with historic places. And this can be done with graduate students and undergrads. It can be a module or an exercise or kind of a one-off assignment, or you can build a whole course around it. One of the things I think is great about teaching with place is that it gets you out of the classroom and who's not up for that every once in a while, students and teachers alike. As Robert already mentioned, um, partnerships can be really, really important in this. And as Austin said in my introduction, I've worked with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, with the National Park Service, with museums and other historical organizations on and off campus. And it doesn't have to be a kind of capital H historic that sometimes we think, oh, only a fancy museum or something that's already marked as, as important historically can be used for this, but really an everyday downtown streetscape or the campus itself is a bit excuse me, is a big part of this. And I think students, college students are often primed to really learn about this new place or this new community that they're joining. And that can really be an entry point for kind of encouraging historical awareness and historical thinking. And I think it can be much, it can be easier to appreciate the connection between past and present when you're in a landscape, when you're thinking about the place. As Terry McDonald said earlier today, that the, the part of the Detroit Observatory now is to be a 21st century portal into a 19th century experience and that it's it's really an invitation it's it's literally an open invitation to think about that past and present the past is not some remote thing way off in the distance it's continuous with the present and places can help remind us of that so the first example I want to talk about, um, you may or may not recognize this building. This is a, a home in Akron, Ohio, which is where Dr. Robert Smith and his wife Ann Smith lived in the mid 20th century. And what's important about this house in, in historical terms is that this is where Alcoholics Anonymous was founded. Dr. Bob, as he was popularly known, and a man named Bill Wilson, who was in Akron from New York as a traveling salesman, founded Alcoholics Anonymous in this house. And I had the opportunity with a group of, group of graduate students to write the nomination of this property to become a National Historic Landmark. This was something that the Park Service wanted to do, um, and we were able to put together this partnership to do it. And a nomination for something for this level of designation is a journal length scholarly product. The students wrote it together. I helped, but they wrote it together. It was an interdisciplinary piece of work. They needed to learn about history. They needed to learn about architecture. They had the opportunity to do a lot of community engagement. They learned how to collaborate. They did it together. 
Uh, they learned a lot of project management skills. They were really in charge. And we also heard earlier today about sometimes the tension that can exist between the research and teaching for a faculty member, different agendas, and how that's different sometimes in the natural sciences versus the humanities. And I want to emphasize that in this case, the research agenda came from our community partners. It was the National Park Service and the group that operates this house as a museum that wanted this to happen. Another point I want to make about this is that being in the space led to better history. As I said, it, it happened in this home. This was where the founding occurred. It was messy. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know it would lead to this worldwide movement. They're hosting alcoholic men in this house that are trying to get to get get their get achieve sobriety. And being in that space showed us how intimate this really was. And it also showed us how important the role was that Ann Smith, Dr. Bob's wife, played in this. There, there was, was no other way it could have been done. She was right there in that space while it was happening. And so we were able to make the case to the Park Service that her name should become part of the name of the property. So that is now the Dr. Robert and Ann Smith home is what it's called by the Park Service. Um, students got to know, as I mentioned, there was a lot of community engagement. Students got to know the stakeholders. When this was uh, successfully designated, the group had a ribbon cutting ceremony. Some of the students got to be there for that. It was just a really wonderful event. Here's a couple of the students in front of the plaque. Um, and it just, it, it was really a wonderful experience that shows history matters. A second uh, opportunity with some of the same group of students decided they wanted to keep going with this kind of work. And we partnered with Cliveden, which is a historic site run by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Philadelphia. And Cliveden already was an NHL. It was designated for its role in the Battle of Germantown in 1777 and for the the kind of Georgian architecture that it represents. It was designated in the early 1960s, a very different time, both historically and in terms of historical scholarship. Well, it has since become better known that the white family that owned this house for generations were slave owners and that they were part of the, the a, a plantation economy that existed in the mid-Atlantic region. In addition to that, the neighborhood around the house has changed drastically over the 20 the late 20th century really, becoming much more racially diverse and much more economically challenged. So the question is what, it's the same house, but how should its history be understood today? So again, the Park Service and Clifton itself um, kind of put together this, this consortium, this collaboration to do a revised and expanded nomination to really reflect the way we think about a place like this today. So once again, the students really took the lead in doing the research and writing. Um, again, a lot of opportunities for community engagement. Here are some of the students presenting, um, presenting their findings at this community event. And then we broke up into small groups. And again, each student was sort of the, the locus of a, of a kind of clustered conversation. And I think the main point that Clifton shows is that more than one story can exist in the same place. So it's not that the Revolutionary War doesn't matter. It's not that the Battle of Germantown doesn't matter. It's that that's not the only story that attaches to this particular place. So I mentioned the National Park Service a couple times. They have tremendous resources about this concept of teaching with historic places. A lot of the curriculum and pedagogy that has been developed is K to 12. Um, but as I think these examples show, it really can be um, extended to college and graduate students. And I think in that way, the Detroit Observatory just has, there's there's so much potential here. And um, I'm just I'm really excited. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dean. Thank you. All right. Well, good, af good afternoon, everybody. And uh, my name is Dean Regis. I'm the astronomer at the Cincinnati Observatory and really honored to be here at this grand reopening here of the Detroit Observatory. In fact, I drove up and I am at the Detroit Observatory right now. I am underneath the telescope. It is up there somewhere. And by the way, uh, when nobody was looking, I snuck up there and took some pictures. It's a, it's a quite an amazing site. I was here a few, uh, well, quite a few years ago, and the renovations are impressive. I can't wait to get the full tour a little bit later on when I'm not so sneaky around here. Sorry, uh, uh, Gary and Austin, but uh, uh, but I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, our observatory in Cincinnati. This is the Cincinnati Observatory. 
uh, located about five miles east of downtown Cincinnati. It is a National Historic Landmark with two uh, really amazing pieces of architecture, the two buildings at the end of the street. And uh, the way that this is set up is so unique in, in the United States is that you, you drive down this residential street, you turn the corner, and at the end of the street is this building. It, it's like it's almost like a mirage when you look back down this street. And, and uh, for a number of years, this was the hidden gem, the unknown place at, in Cincinnati, and people would stumble upon it by accident. Uh, but uh, in the last 20 years since I, I've been there, I started in 2000 as their uh, outreach astronomer, as their educator, basically. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've made this kind of a, a, a regional uh, a tourist attraction, a, a regional space that the community can come and do astronomy and history. So we have our main building here at the end of the street, which... I don't know. It seems like if there was a, a, a picture definition of observatory, I, I well, I guess I like this one. So that's why I think this would be the picturesque one. But uh, it's just one of those sites that that captures people's attention. And it, the, the biggest thing that we get with our visitors is wow. Wow is the most common thing that we hear from everybody. And this is really kind of uh, kind of turned our philosophy quite a bit because we, of course, want to do education. We, of course, want to do preservation, conservation. But one of the side things that we figured out is that entertainment is a very powerful part of doing astronomy. And especially when you have a, a staff and volunteer base that is, <laughs> I got to say, pretty entertaining <laughs> because we have so many people that are really passionate about the subject and that comes through to people and it's very infectious. So we do a combination of history, education, and definitely a little bit of entertainment as we go around. So this is the main building at the end of the street. Then we have a secondary building, looks like that. Uh, and this is the building that has our pride and joy, the oldest telescope in the United States, uh, made in 1845. It's uh, 16 feet long, 11 inches in diameter, and made out of mahogany and brass. It is a gorgeous scientific instrument but is also, also fully functional. Uh, this is a telescope we use pretty much every single clear night with the public. And it is just incredible that it's in such a great condition um, and that it's, it's so beloved and used. That's, uh, I think, the key. And I think that's something that uh, Dr. Stencil mentioned too, is that the, the, the best way to keep these uh, working is, is to keep using them. And because uh, I can actually contrast that with our second telescope. So this is the older one. This is the, uh, the one. That, and this was also made in, in Munich, Germany, or Bavaria before Germany was even a country, uh, and shipped over to Cincinnati and saw first light 1845. So its birthday is a week from yesterday. But we also have a newer telescope on site in the main building. This is our newer one from 1904, an Alvin Clark and Sons telescope, 16 inches in diameter, 22 feet long. And this is the newer one. This one is used a lot less than the other one. And well, it needs a lot more maintenance for some reason. I don't know what it is, but this one is just magic. It just like, we oiled it like two years ago and it's still too loose. Like we were waiting for it to like seize up and it's, I don't know. It's just the engineering on that one's unbelievable. And showing people this one also, this one we use a little bit to do more hands-on things that we let people uh, move the telescope by hand. We let people open the roof, spin the roof. Everything is done by, uh, there's no electronics at all in this room that, that work the telescopes. And so they get to have that experience of actually seeing how these things work. And it's just so amazing to see people get mesmerized by this 19th century technology. Well, I guess this is 20th century, isn't it? Well, close enough. So now our main focus at the Cincinnati Observatory is education. So we do about 800 programs a year on site, off site and online. Uh, we have a staff of uh, four educators and uh, about 100 volunteers or so that do a lot of programs. So this is daytime, nighttime. Uh, all the time, it seems like. And so it's a very active place. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the, the more creative elements that we brought to this since, uh, in, since we kind of took this over as, the, as an educational institution, because you know the problems are we're five miles from downtown. So the light pollution is pretty bad, as Dr. Bob mentioned. 
Um, and so this is, uh, this is a problem that we can't see the faint things. We can't see the, the galaxies, the nebulas, the star clusters. But what we can do is show people the moon and planets, which is incredibly powerful. This is for people that have never looked through a telescope before. And if they can come and look through this telescope or that telescope, it is a memorable experience. And so it, it's more of access. So our proximity to a city is bad for viewing bad for research great for the public because we're within drive of most of the country they can come to us so a couple of the things that we kind of throw together with this is, is this is this is we do so many different programs but this kind of sums up a little bit of kind of our philosophy in cincinnati is that we we throw events we throw star parties basically and and revolve this around the power of the telescope that the telescope is the central focus of this and that people are just naturally drawn to scopes naturally drawn to the looking through this and, and putting your eyeball up to the actual telescope which was a little bit of a tricky part during covid uh but i'll talk a little bit about how we figured that out too um, and so we do this in a variety of ways at the observatory sidewalk astronomy where we ambush them and people will just gravitate towards the telescopes we also want to throw in observing satellites getting outside there using green lasers and i know some people don't like using the green lasers but when you work with a lot of kids uh, i know i guess sometimes when people are like oh that green laser was cool and i'm like well i'm showing you a planet and they're like no but show me the green laser i know i know but they are really powerful to get people outside under the stars and pointing some things and uh, then of course solar viewing is awesome to include as well because well uh daytime's got a lot of good stuff and uh so we can show people the sun safely especially we have two big eclipses coming up here at uh, in october 2023 and april 2024. so and then when we throw kind of bigger events these are all pre-covid and hopefully we will have them post-covid uh where we have events around big um you know annual annual uh, i guess uh times where the planets are most visible. So Jupiter and Saturn are our most popular ones. Uh, we do Moon Day, Monday, uh, Sunday, 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 where we look at the sun and eat ice cream. I mean, come on, astronomy plus solar viewing plus ice cream. That's pretty hard to beat there. Uh, and then meteorite nights, super moon nights, late night date nights. Um, this is where we have people come, uh, you know, 1030 to midnight, come to the observatory after hours, adults only. Oh man, those are really good and super popular. So there's lots of creative ways to kind of get this uh, across to people. And, uh, and that's the thing is that you know, we want to preserve the history, but if people aren't going to be there to see it, you have to have reasons for them to get there too. And for us, it seems like the telescopes are the thing, absolutely positively. Well, let's see, I'll throw it back to you guys down there. If I can figure out how to unshare. Thank you all so much. All right. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Those were always really good. And uh, I do have a couple of questions for myself for everybody just to kind of get things started. And then we'll start to approach some of the questions from the YouTube chat. But uh, for Dean, um, coming from like a similar facility, do you find like any benefits and challenges of using a 19th century observatory to share stuff with the public. I know people have very modern and digital expectations of astronomy. Uh, do you find that um, like an, a, an engaging thing or a challenging thing? Yeah, we've been tossing this around every five years ago, or every five years or so, we kind of tossed around this idea. I was like, okay, what if we add some modern technology to the telescope? What if we add some cameras and do digital imaging and do long exposure photographs? You know, those ones that you can kind of generate over and over again. And we, uh, during COVID, it was kind of like, well, you know, how are we going to take turns at the eyepiece? That made every, you know me really, I was like, wait a second. All right, we're gonna put our eyeballs next to the thing that somebody else has put their eyeballs next to. And and uh, so we thought, well, let's put some cameras. Let's try the cameras. They were incredibly unpopular. Like 
disastrously unpopular. Like people are like, yeah, all right. So I'm going to look at a TV screen while you point that old observe telescope. Uh, and we, we and, and even pre-COVID when we tried this, we could yeah, attach a camera, we beam it down to the classroom and people were just like, eh, you know, I mean, I could be at home on the internet doing it. And, and so for us, it's, it's this throwback is, is so powerful. I mean, you, and, and everybody that's done sidewalk astronomy or amateur astronomy, when you share a view through the actual eyepiece with somebody, their eyes just face entirely lights up. It is so powerful as, as you watching them get excited, <laughs> it is incredible. And so uh, we kind of think, well, let's not overcomplicate it. Let's, let's go, that's what that scope was for. We can have definitely a combination where we can get modern telescopes outside with this equipment. Uh, but the, the part of the, the charm of this is doing something that people have been doing for 175 years in a, in a way that they do it. Um, so, it, you know, that is the, 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 should we modernize or not modernize? It's, it's kind of, the public is kind of telling us, you know, this, this old style is, is so unique and so cool uh, uh, that, you know, it's hard to, hard to argue with that. I could add a little bit to that <clears throat> because of the same severe light pollution. We uh, added some technology to the old scope in Denver uh, called encoders, which allows us a little bit more of the go-to operation, but was done in a very clever, non-obvious way to not change the overall appearance, yet it gives the operator and a laptop sky map a chance to find fainter objects despite the challenges of a bright sky. Yes, I know for us, that's part of our big goals is to try out um, new ways to connect technology uh, with the telescope, and we hope to uh, sort of find accessibility uh, lanes that we can benefit from uh, by sharing images from the telescope, not necessarily as the way to look through it, but to kind of expand its view. Uh, kind of related to that for Michelle, I guess kind of thinking about, you know, the historic charm or the con context, the way they used to do things, uh, do you find it difficult when you're teaching in a historic location to bridge the gap between the historic context, like why the technology was designed the way it was um, and why they may have looked with, you know, an eyepiece and bridging that gap between someone from, you know, 2022, a student who's like only 18 or 19 years old and who's lived a digital life? Um, are there difficulties in bridging that gap of context because the needs are so different? Well, I think there's definitely a, a tension there. And I, I mean, I'm personally very gratified to hear what Dean was saying about the, the reaction of people wanting that, um, you know, that direct experience. And I think we're going to see that even more coming out of the pandemic, right, if possible. But I think there's, you know, there is a risk that it's easy to dismiss the past and past scientific work, because if, <laughs> if I can understand it, it can't have been that you know, it can't be that amazing or whatever. Sometimes I think people even think that if it, accessibility can kind of cut both ways. But so, so I think um, what I was saying before about trying to think about the past as continuous with the present, when the technology looks so different, there there is a tendency I think to dismiss it as not relevant or not useful or even something to almost make fun of or you know, as just, just sort of looks old timey and and not relevant. But I think it. it it, it can be a way, so much of this, right, is, is looking for a way in, looking for a way to start the conversation with somebody. And I think that that, um, its difference can then be an advantage to say, you know, to just sort of start that, here's how this was used. And I've been struck just even working with you all just a little bit over the last few weeks at how much there is a historical element to the evolution of this field and of the data, right? And of the accumulation of data over time is a big part of what, what advances this, this field of knowledge. So I think those are different ways to get into this intersection maybe of like time and technology and knowledge. It all kind of works together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and Michelle, that you made me think of something else that maybe Austin was hint hinting at the question too about accessibility. That is the one drawback with our observatory and most historic observatories is 
accessibility. Our domes are not handicap accessible. Um, and so that is something where technology can play a role in is to bring those things to to folks that they can see them and interact with them. And that's one of the big challenges that we have. And I think Dr. Stencil had in Chamberlain and that we have here in Detroit too. Right, but uh, Detroit has made a significant step forward in several ways. Uh, ADA accessibility, sure, not all the way to the dome necessarily, but a huge improvement over crawling up the hill otherwise. And to Michelle's point, uh, uh, 10 ish years ago, we were invaded by the steampunk crowd. Does anyone remember the steampunk uh, fad? Well, they loved these 19th century engineering marvel, marvels, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we were happy to accommodate them and their interests. Uh, similarly, a little bit further throwback, uh, you, you may be aware of a group known as the Buffalo Soldiers, Civil War era black uh, army folks, and their uh, there are recreation groups, and one of them dropped by one time wanting to do uh, things in the observatory, uh, you know, skits and plays, and we're happy to accommodate that. So it does go historic as well as beyond astronomy. One last comment about the technology. A lot of people with their modern cell phones seem eager to try to get pictures through the telescope itself, and half the time it works pretty well. So... We don't discourage it. Oh, by, uh, Dr. Stencil, you're always a half uh, glass, half full guy. Half the time it works. Yeah, and then the other half, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, Very, always optimistic, Dr. Stencil. Right. You have that experience, too, I imagine. I was going to say the opposite. Half the time it doesn't work. But yeah. <laughs> we, we, we tried to invest them. in these, uh, actually, these eyepiece adapters where you could just put your phone right into it and they screw in there. We got some cheap ones that didn't work, and then we got some good ones that did work. And uh, yeah, it is pretty, pretty, you're right. A lot of people want to get a picture of stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we even have some members that, that put them on there and then they take a picture and they can airdrop the picture to the next person. Oh, yeah. And that's, yeah, people really do like to have that takeaway. Um, and then I kind of connect the previous question uh, to something for Robert. Uh, as someone who's been in an observatory for a long time, and this goes for Dean as well, uh, do you have to sometimes play with visitor expectations or preconceptions of an observatory teaching about how an observatory works while also getting around that someone's walked in and thinks you're a planetarium? Uh, or an astrologer. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the um, worst one. Astrologer, definitely. <laughs> Yes, uh, very definitely. You know, each member of the audience, each group, family, club, whatever has come in, uh, has a very different background set of expectations. So we try to find those common denominators and certainly viewing the bright objects that are readily accessible, uh, moon, planet, stars, clusters, provides an instant commonality uh, basis for discussion <clears throat> along those lines since I'm a light pollution solution fanatic. Every time I have a chance to help someone use the eyepiece, I can often mention, you'd see this a lot better if we didn't have this horrific light pollution, just to plant the seed of what could be done in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the, the big uh, things that we've learned with expectations, especially on cloudy nights, mm -hmm. and of course we have mm -hmm. uh, some observatories here that are, not in the best weather locations, uh, but uh, I, one thing that I find is, you know, there are people that come that they think that we can see through the clouds, that there's somehow a magical thing to there. And when they hear that we can't, that they're very, very disappointed. So what I've been doing lately is uh, showing I'm more mad about the clouds than they are. Like I go in and I say, you know, nobody's more upset about the clouds than this guy right here because uh, I wanted to share all this stuff with you. And I wanted to like let you see all these telescopes and, you know, you can come back. Uh, and I, I think that kind of like smooths things over because people then walk away saying, well, first off, they say, wait, wait a second. This Dean guy's a little off the off his rocker. But number two, they'd say, well, all right, I guess I guess I'm not as mad as Dean is about it. And they go back and they go home a little bit happier. But yeah, and then having a good cloudy plan, you got to have a good cloudy plan all the time, at least for us Midwestern observer, uh, observatories. Uh, and then kind of good timing to sort of finish up 
this point is uh, a question from the audience. Uh, aside from things like eyepieces, um, is your goal to keep the telescopes as they would have been originally? Uh, it's tricky for Cincinnati because the, the telescope it went under a lot of modifications. So we don't have this great documentation of what it was originally. We have these other kind of, we can piece it together from other types of telescopes that were very similar to that age. But uh, you know, it had been used for research under different auspices for different reasons. And so other parts were added, other parts were taken away. The clock right. drive is not original. Um, but one thing that we've been doing is, is to try to actually make it older. So these modifications that were put in the late 19th century and 20th century that don't really add to it now, or in fact, some cases didn't work <laughs> in the 21st century. We you know, discuss it with our historians and we say, well, okay, it doesn't do anything. It didn't, wasn't original. What do we do with it? And the, the consensus was, well, let's take it off. Let's, you know, if it's 1950s technology, then what is it? And it doesn't, and it doesn't work, then it's doubly bad. Um, so that's one thing. And then with our domes, we've also modified those because they were electrified. So you push a button and the dome would spin. So we retrofitted it and disconnected the motor and attached the old crank. And now you turn the roof by hand. So we try to, as whenever possible, to make it older as, as much as possible. I'll add uh, for the Denver Observatory, very similar story. The scope has been added to, and uh, you know, aluminum slabs. We we've removed those that we could without sacrificing functionality. Uh, there are certainly camps, those who want it to be an original, super original, you know, no modern parts. And the other camp says, well, what do you do when things break? You have to remachine parts, you have to replace things, uh, and you can do things better. The original focuser had largely failed. A modern focuser, very efficient, very utilitarian, blends right in, uh, helps us out a lot. And don't get me started on dome and slit problems. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Um, let's see a question from the audience or let's see a question. So what are some approaches you have taken to expanding your audiences and, and what ways in which you might tailor specific events or programs to specific audiences? Let me chime in briefly on that. Um, we have like Detroit, a one holder in the sense one person at the eyepiece at a time. And that's a profound limitation. With some care, uh, skilled docents, we can process a person per minute at the eyepiece, but it doesn't take long to add up that, you know, the number of nighttime hours is finite and staffing is finite. So there's only so many we can accommodate, plus these buildings are generally pretty small by modern standards. So it's, it's, there's no point in inviting the whole city to show up at once. We can't accommodate them. In terms of outreach to other audiences, mostly word of mouth, satisfied groups talk to other satisfied, interested groups, and you know, it's a continuous feed of interest. Dean, comparable? Yeah, I would say that sounds about right. Um, yeah, we have our two buildings, so I guess we call them two, be by your standards, a two-holer then, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and our, our big, uh, one of our big assets is uh, a, a real good core of amateur astronomers that will bring their own telescopes out too. That really, really helps to get people, I mean, everybody wants to see through the older telescopes, but while they're waiting, um, they could see through the other ones and talk to the amateurs and talk to them about subjects, you know, that they get this more one on one attention. And so that has been a huge plus for us that having that uh, around. I think the other thing that, uh, you know, Dr. Stencil was mentioning, you know, having a staff at Chamberlain would go do wonders. And that's, I think, what our formula was uh, in Cincinnati is that having the staff that can expand things during the daytime is because everybody associates observatories with nighttime and 
that is definitely cool. Uh, but there's so many other things to do in the daytime. And our audiences are expanded through these outreach efforts by our staff. So we go out to schools and do programs. We go out to libraries. It's ways to kind of get the word out about the observatory mm -hmm. and things that we do. Uh, and then we also welcome field trips during the daytime as well. And what we found is that uh, our, our source of revenue on that is grants. So grants and donors are really willing to give towards education. It's a lot easier to sell that to foundations, especially saying, you know, we're going to reach X number of kids and uh, we can even offer right you know, right now we're offering free busing. So you we want to remove those barriers to people to come and also make it a little more equitable too for, for schools, especially that can't, uh, do field trips as often or can't uh, come at night. You want to make opportunities and remove any of those barriers. And that's at least our formula has, has been foundations and grants that have really made that possible. I, I, I do like that point a lot of, you know, expanding your audiences. It's like you want people to want to come to you, but I think it's also immensely important to be present where they are. You know, you go out and do outreach and meet them uh, in their community to be like, you know, I want to be here with you too. Is that okay? And then you kind of build that relationship and then it usually grows from there. Yeah, we did an event uh, or did a project uh, 2019 where uh, Cincinnati has 52 official neighborhoods. So uh, the city of Cincinnati has incorporated all these neighborhoods. And of course, I think 52, what do I think of? Well, it's 52 weeks in a year. And so I was like, let's bring a program to each neighborhood in one year. And I think it turned my hair gray, but we did it. Uh, we just, uh, it was, so it was really you know, getting to all different neighborhoods, reaching everybody in the city with one program at least and bringing telescopes there. I think that it's just, it's, it's, it's great to go out to. And yeah, having the staff is, that's, that's the real, thing you need that to, to, to make that work. Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of uh, switch points for a little while, um, the Detroit Observatory is part of the Bentley Historical Library. And so as uh, that's an important relationship for us now, there'll be a lot of trade-off in programming and um, teaching through the Detroit Observatory. So for Michelle, do you have any specific things that you think are beneficial about the Bentley having the Detroit Observatory as a location? Well, I think it, uh, it, so it has the potential, I think, to raise a profile of both in a way as important parts of and centers for the history of the university. Mm -hmm. They, it, because of the, because of the focus of the observatory on it, in STEM and astronomy that that has a potential to bring in more people and make them aware of the importance of history, which I'm always in favor of. Um, and I think, as I, I alluded to at least earlier, that the Bentley has has a tremendous amount of experience and leadership in innovative teaching with primary source materials. And that, you know, you in a way you could look at it as the, the observatory is the single biggest artifact now that the Bentley works with. So that that there is a lot of extrapolation, I think, of the kinds of pedagogy and the kinds of teaching that can be done. Plus the fact that it's it's now a, a space um, that's on a, a different part of campus and just has a has the um, potential, I think, to to draw audiences and and as I said, just raise a profile in terms of awareness for both. Michelle, can I ask? Uh, you know, in using you know historic items, is there there are things that you know, as educators, we need to watch out for, like, is there, there danger zones of working with, you know, really old, historic, rare things? You mean to the objects or to the people or both? Or? I was, well, I was thinking the objects, but both, uh, you know, like, so using a 175 year old telescope, uh, is there, you know, I guess, is there, what are the, the pitfalls to watch out for? Well, I should say I'm not a conservator, so I'm not an expert in kind of the materials and and kind of, you know, ensuring the integrity of the object itself. But I, I think 
yes, wear and tear is always a factor, although it sounds like in some of these things, it's kind of like use it or lose it, that the more it's used, the better it is. And it sounds like too, and this is not unique to telescopes, right? That some of the workmanship and materials from the 19th century are better than the 20th. So they're actually more durable in that way. Or um, the 21st. <laughs> or the 21st, yeah. Whatever so, century we're in. So I think, um, just I, I can offer that sort of general caveat, right? That if it's fragile mm -hmm. and if it's and if it's unique, right? So that's part of it too, which I think also gets at even what you were saying about some of your visitors. Do they do they want to look through the actual thing? Because if they're looking at it at a screen, to them that feels like an experience they can have anywhere. So the so the fact that there are just a few of these and that they are that old, it's hard to put into words. But there is definitely a kind of you know, intangible value that we feel, that's why they want to look at the real one, right? Or be putting their eye through the real one. But other than, um, again, I'm not a conservator, so I keep saying that as a disclaimer, but in, mm -hmm. in terms of general issues of fragility or kind of wear and tear, I don't know that it's more, I don't know that it's more fraught or problematic than using one built 10 years ago, necessarily. Um. Another one for Michelle with like the three of our observatories. I'm kind of drawing a line on our <laughs> panels. Uh, so we're all historic places. We have visitors where we're teaching. We're teaching classes. We're teaching children and families. Um, but it's we're, we're STEM places, often sharing some sort of history. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any thoughts on like weaknesses where STEM places miss out, where we don't really capture the same? level of credibility and integrity with teaching history or places that places that focus on STEM but have historical components, are we missing something, do you think? I think this afternoon's panels show that that's not often the case, at least people who are thinking, who are, who are being thoughtful about the evolution of astronomy. And I, I would say it's probably the fact that this is through the lens of of historic places, right? Mm -hmm. So that brings a kind of, I think, sensibility and awareness that you 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 take the long view because your building is asking you to take the long view. Your equipment is asking mm -hmm. you to take a longer view. Mm -hmm. I do think, in general, sometimes in the history of science, so that's that's kind of that where I'm coming in at that. But that that scientists are often, I'm going to generalize. Um, can be very excited about kind of current and future kinds of developments, right? That there's new technology all the time. There's new kinds of findings. It's oriented to the now and future sometimes more than the past. The past is seen as something that we've built on maybe, but is to get to the now or what could be even more exciting that's right around the corner with the next big number cruncher or you know piece of equipment or whatever. Um, so I think I've said already a couple of times, I think this risk of like seeing the past as divorced from the present or as just sort of a prototype, a more primitive prototype for the present or something like that. Um, and I think that can be a real risk at sort of flattening out the past, not taking it on its own terms. And I think some of the presuppositions of STEM can set you up for that. Um, but I'm certainly not seeing that here. And I think that's less of an issue than it was even like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think you're, I mean, I think you're onto something that is potentially two different worldviews and kinds of approaches. Um, mm -hmm. But that when you, again, maybe that is part of the value of being in a historic building that, that it's, it's priming you as, as STEM folks to take what I would say is, you know, a, a nuanced longer view of mm -hmm. the, of the evolution Michelle, of your own field and also the passage of time and what that means. Michelle, astronomers are constantly looking at the past yeah, well, right. Life right. limits us to only seeing what's gone on before. So I think if we were to weave that into our narratives, maybe it would help connect present and past, as you suggest. No, that that is really important. And as I said, I have learned a lot just in sort of thinking through what we well might say today. And I I I sort of knew that, but had not understood the implications. That right, literally what you're using for data is from the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, a question from the uh, audience uh, for Michelle. Uh, they say, I'd love to hear your insights about the degrees to which young people are interested and engaged in history these days. Do they care about it? 
Well, that's that's a big question. And I have to say, I have not been in the classroom myself to teach for the last few years. Um, but some do, some don't. They're not and they're not necessarily engaging with it, I think, in always in a formal classroom sense. But I think many people come to history sometimes when they get older or sometimes it's because something else is the is the prompt, right? They wanna mm -hmm. learn about their own family or they wanna learn about a place or they have some other interest like astronomy and wanna learn the backstory of something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, yeah. And I, think, and I think the key with all of these fields of endeavor is what we've been hearing all day is kind of meet people where they are, right? And Robert was talking about that too. People come in with all kinds of different ex expectations, knowledge base, assumptions. Um, and what I what I think is so great about an observatory and historic buildings, and when it's both, it's even better, is that you share the experience and that's what gives you the baseline to start a conversation. Um, so I think it was Sally who said earlier, of like, if you have hands-on experience, that's how you build great scientists. Well, I would say that's also how you build great historians and archivists, mm -hmm. um, that you just by doing it gives you a different point of view and generally makes you more invested. So I'm, I'm not, that, I think that's the best I can do to the question of, of whether young people continue well, to care about history. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. I personally, just more recently, we've been hiring student docents to help you know, teach the story of the Detroit Observatory and teach the story of astronomy here. And it's been cool because a lot of them have come from that perspective of like, oh, big telescope, oh, space. And then they get here and they're, they learn about how the timekeeping worked and the benefits that it provided Michigan. And they're just like, wait, what, it did what? <laughs> it provided time for the state and it did this. Uh, and it's just kind of cool to see them sort of surprised by not the limitations of the technology, but the limitations that the technology was trying to uh, solve. Uh, back in the 19th century. And uh, yeah, I certainly, it's like, it's like a genre of music that you've never cared about. And then you hear that one song and suddenly it, it clicks and you're into it. One of the most remarkable history things that we come up with that, it, and I'll throw this out to you. Do you all remember picking up a land telephone line or a pay phone and calling a number to get a recorded message of what time it was? <laughs> When I say that out loud to an audience now, I, it sounds completely ridiculous. But it's like, yeah, so pick, uh, and so the observatory in Cincinnati would sp supply the time to the city, just uh, as Detroit did, and probably just as Chamberlain did in Denver. That was part of our, our functions. But isn't that just crazy to say that out loud? Like that that's how you would get your time is you'd call a phone number and it would automate you know, an automated message. And by the way, in Cincinnati, you can still call that number. You can pick up your cell phone and find out what time it is. Well, but when I said it out loud for the first time, I thought this is the most ridiculous thing, a statement I've ever said. And the audience was just like glazed over. Like, what are you talking about? your cell phone about? presents you the time. Well, I know that's wanted, the joke. <laughs> if you want to call it out, I've, I've posted the number to the NIST atomic clock, 303-499-7111. I know that's the that's the the, the the my dry sense of humor, uh, Doctor Stencil. Yeah, pick up your cell phone. Don't look at it, but pick it up and call this number, and I'll tell you a time. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions for uh, Robert Stencil from the YouTube chat. And we talked a little bit about this in the chat, but uh, for everybody, someone asked: Did the transit telescope slits at the Denver Observatory ever get repaired? And there was also a project to uh, add finely controlled uh, tracking and braking with the uh, telescope, like a drive mechanism. Uh, was that successful and is it still in place? Right. Um, in terms of the transit slit, so again, being vintage, a transit instrument was parked there because timekeeping was the thing, even though that was the moment when the U.S. Naval Observatory began to uh, seize control of the national time standards and reporting. So local observatories lost that stream of income, importantly. Uh, the transit wing to the old observatory, uh, over time, you know, open roof, leaky problems, 
uh, got roofed over, closed up, and it uh, was only the 1990s when we found some fundings to restore parts of the observatory. We were able to uh, basically repair that section of the roof and at least open some limited functionality so that uh, transit type observati- observing, watching stars cross the south horizon, south uh, the meridian, uh, that became possible again. So yes, and that kind of reflects on comments Michelle uh, made earlier about trying to restore originality, uh, yet keeping up with the standards. Now, would having a completely functional transit slit in an old building be more important than say, using solar panels in that same space someday? It's a trade-off. Second part of the question was about tracking um, <clears throat> yes, we had some major mechanical issues during the past decade we had to address, uh, going back to choice of lubricants back in the day. Old lubricants tend to turn into epoxy, and epoxy is not a great lubricant. So we had to pull apart the telescope in a major way to repair that, and rather than use original type lubricants, oil-based We went with modern lithium greases, certainly invisible to the viewer, but functionally, we hope they'll hold up for decades at this point. And then there was a similar question, right? I just misread the (laughs) the observatory name, but it's good to know the state of that. Uh, Same for the Cincinnati Observatory. There was a project about replacing the drive. Yeah, we had um, some, we wanted to do some research again at the Cincinnati Observatory. So a group of amateur astronomers got together, made a proposal to say, well, we want to look for, uh, we want to do some kind of uh, double star work. We want to look at some variable stars. Uh, And then even later, they were going to try to replicate, you know, find a viewing uh, exoplanets using our, our big scope. And so the question was, could they put uh, more modern tracking on an old scope so they could track a lot better, take longer exposure photographs? So I know it was debated pretty hotly in our uh, group and it was, uh, or was it? Maybe they just put it on there. Anyway, they put it on there. <laughs> and uh, so it, there was for a, a period of time that they had a, 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 a more modern or at least an electric drive that it regulated the old mechanical ones so they could take these longer exposure photographs. And so that, that group was meeting for uh, quite a while, for quite a few years. They kind of, it kind of fizzled out because of clouds. They had so many clouded out days that the, the, the team got a little frustrated, uh, but the, the mechanics all worked on it well. And so we, we did prove that we could do semi-modern research from this location with the, that extra modification of using uh, some electronics to, to track the scope, to make the scope track better. But, uh, but yeah, uh, oh, but uh, also something Michelle mentioned is that usually the newer things don't last as long as the older <laughs> things. Newer thing didn't last. <laughs> and so it broke down and it is gone. And now we're back to the old thing that works pretty good. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's all my questions. I don't, don't we miss any questions in the, uh, the chat. I don't think so. So thank you all very much for joining us today as part of this symposium. Uh, personally, it's a privilege to hear from all of you. You all have like pretty good experience in places I'm trying to learn personally. So it's wonderful to hear from you all. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all thank so you. much. Thank you. Cheers.